an introduction and introduce our great speaker, Aaron. So we'll get started in just one moment. Thanks all. Thank you everybody for being here. In honor of National Family Caregiver Month this month, um, we are excited to offer this four part webinar series for our cancer caregivers. We recognize the importance, important role you play in your life, the life of your loved one, and the joys and challenges you may face as you navigate your caregiving experience. We thank you for taking time to join us today and for the invaluable and instrumental care that you provide. I'm joining you today from um, our DC location. I am the senior director uh, our vice president, I'm sorry, of partner support with Cancer Support Community. And if you're not familiar with Cancer Support Community, we are a global nonprofit of 175 plus locations. That includes our CSC uh, centers and Gildas Club locations. We're also at hospitals and clinic partnerships. We deliver more than $50 million in free support and navigation services to patients and family members. We administer a toll-free helpline and produce award-winning educational and digital resources that reach more than 1 million people each year. We also conduct cutting edge research on emotional, psychosocial, and financial journey of cancer patients and advocate at all levels of government for policies to help individuals whose lives have been disrupted by cancer. So again, this first workshop um, is the first and four of what's in your first aid kit series, um, supports and resources for caregivers. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Aaron Kent. Dr. Kent is an associate professor and associate chair in health policy and management at UNC Chapel Hill Gilling School of Global Public Health. She's also a full member of Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and Health Services Research Fellow at the Cecil G. Sheps Center. She works with rural health research programs there. Her disciplinary background is in epidemiology, mixed methods research, and health services research. Dr. Kent focuses on the important and social context on health outcomes for individuals with serious illness and their families. With 130 plus publications in patient and family-centered outcomes research. Her current work is primarily focused on serious, Ill serious illness caregiving. She formerly served as a program director and scientific advisor for the Outcomes Research Branch at the National Cancer, in Cancer Institute. So again, thank you for joining us and I'll turn things over to Dr. Ken. Thanks so much, Kelly. Thank you, Kara, for inviting me to, to talk with you all today. Um, I, this is getting to talk to you, um, albeit um, over the, the web and not in person is my greatest um, pleasure and honor. Um, and you know, I, I know this is a, a, a webinar, um, so it's not quite the same as all being together in person, but um, I, please use the tools of this um, that are available to you. Let me just remind everyone that Cancer Support Community is recording this, which means if you feel like you missed something, um, this is going to be available to you later. Um, Kara has, uh, is gonna monitor the chat. So if you, if you have a question or a comment you wanna put in there, please go ahead and use the chat feature. Um, and we're gonna probably save most of the, the Q&A part toward the end of the presentation just for flow purposes. But if you have something that's in your mind um, throughout the presentation and you wanna put it in there, we'll, we'll, we'll scroll through the chats later as well. So let me first start by saying, um, uh, Kelly gave a, a really kind introduction to me and talked about you know, what I do professionally. I do wanna um, tell you all that I am a, a researcher, as, as Kelly mentioned, and, a, and an associate professor in a school of public health here at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and my work does focus on, on cancer patient outcomes, including quality of life and the impact that cancer has had on families and including cancer caregiving, the subject of this talk, but I'm not a clinician. Um, I do not have experience providing direct medical or psychosocial care, um, so I want to put that out there. Um, my role today is to tell you what the research tells us about what being a family caregiver is like. And when I say research, I mean research that we get from surveys, um, from interviews, from really rich discussions with caregivers um, themselves. Uh, so that that is coming through the, the data that I'll be telling you. Each, each data point is a, is a very rich and detailed story. Um, and we know from, from, from this research um, that, that cancer can have a profound impact on family and that um, 
the impact on family is often the number one concern of cancer patients themselves, just indicating how critically important it is that we pay attention to our cancer patients' families in addition to the patients themselves. Okay, so let me just make sure. Oh, and I have nothing um, to disclose in this presentation today. Okay, so what my job today is to give you the 101. This is part of a, a four-part series. We'll um, we'll circle back to the other uh, the other uh, presentations that are even part of the series at the end of this talk. But this is the first one. So this is the introductory talk. This is the who, the what, the how, the where, the what next of caregiving, right? And to be honest with you, um, many of you on the on this webinar today are likely better positioned to me than me to give this talk because you may well be serving as a caregiver right now. So I'm just here to give you some language and concepts and again, some data behind that role, the work that, 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 that you, that many people are doing right now that care. Um, so we'll first start by doing an introduction about what we mean when we say caregiver because that's not a term that resonates with everybody um, to get us on the same page. And then we'll talk about some characteristics of cancer caregivers. Uh, what kinds of things that they do to support um, their loved one, how they do it all, um, and really importantly, where they can find help. And we'll do a review at the end of some next steps and then get into some Q&A. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and um, get off to it. All right, an introduction to caregivers. It's, um, let's, let's go for it. All right, so let's start with the definition. There's lots of definitions out there for, for terms that can mean different things. And I'm gonna give you a definition, one that I think um, isn't perfect, but is useful. So the one I use to guide my thinking is that a family caregiver is someone that assists a family member or friend with a serious health problem, illness, or disability by providing care, which is typically unpaid, usually at home, and generally involving significant effort, okay? So that's really definitive, right? Um, we wanna be inclusive in our definition because some caregivers report feeling invisible. Um, some might be getting actually a stipend uh, from a program to help with the direct care that they're providing a family member. It's rare, but sometimes that does uh, occur. Um, and that can be a very helpful benefit. Um, and some might be caregiving at a distance for providing a, a lot of support and taking um, a lot of time. And, um, and although caregivers are often putting in a lot of hours to help, their, um, to help the person that they're supporting, um, there's often a lot of variability and that also very varies over time. So, you know, many people may not refer to themselves as a caregiver. It's not a term that necessarily resonates with all, but it is a helpful umbrella term that sometimes healthcare professionals and researchers use to recognize all of the critically important ways in which someone might support a loved one with a serious health problem. Okay, so uh, how many people are actually in this role at a given time? It's difficult to estimate that. We don't have a, uh, we have cancer registries where we actually report cancer. And so we can kind of get a sense of how many people are living with cancer at a given time, but we don't really have the same for, for caregivers, right? So we do, um, however, have some surveys um, out there that have, have attempted to answer this question about how many people are caring for someone with cancer. Um, and the National Alliance for Caregiving conducts a survey every five years and their most recent estimates um, from a report of data that were collected in 2019 is that approximately 53 million pe people, adults in the US, so one in five Americans are, are caring for a loved one with a serious medical condition. Okay, so that's everybody. That's not just for people who are caring for someone with cancer. Um, we think that there's anywhere from three to six million of those 53 that are caring for someone with cancer. It's not an easy thing to estimate because um, someone who's caring for someone with cancer, the, the person might have more, uh, more than just cancer as a chronic condition. They could have dementia, they could have other, other serious health problems. So it's hard to get an exact estimate, but 53 million is a very large number. And it is safe to say that there are, um, that there are millions of people out there who are fitting in the role of, a, of, of being a caregiver. Um, so uh, former first lady Rosalind Carter is quoted as saying, there are four kinds of people in the world those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver, right? So uh, four kinds is sometimes what that's shortened to. All right, so what does 53 million look like? OK, 
okay? So here's a map of the U.S. in gray. That's just something that we're familiar with, right? So 53 million is kind of a hard number to, to grasp until you start thinking about it like this. It's a number that's about equal to the population size currently of all of the states you see colored in an orange. So that's Washington State, Utah, South Dakota, Nebraska, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, and New York, okay? All of those, if you added up all the, the population sizes of all of those states, that would be about 53 million people. So that's when we say 53 million caregivers in the U.S., that's about what we mean. Okay, now we're going to do a little interaction here, hopefully, hoping that this is going to work um, and that the technology uh, works with us and not against us. Um, I am going to put a poll on the screen from something called Poll Everywhere. And what um, Poll Everywhere does is it allows you at home to take your phone or actually your, your computer. And um, <clears throat> if you go to at the top, you see if you're on your computer, you can go to Poll Ev. So that's P O L L um, P O L L E V dot com slash Aaron Kent 098. I know that's a lot of things to type. Um, you can go there on your computer or you can text 2233 and you have to actually put in the text Aaron Kent 098. OK, and then what you can do is once you've done that, you've gone either to the Poll Ev or you've gone to um, you've gone on your on your cell phone, you should be able to go ahead and answer this question. So I'm going to and it's just you just put one word. It's, if you were caring for someone with cancer, what do you call yourself? Could be caregiver, could be consult, could be something else. Okay. And if hopefully you all can see now that people are starting to answer. Um, and what will happen is we'll start, we'll give it a, a, a couple of minutes. We'll see what people say to get a sense of um, how people refer to themselves um, across this webinar. And what, what's happening right now is it's creating a word cloud um, and it's shifting as more and more people respond. And so if two people type the same word, like for example, caregiver, then the, that word's gonna get bigger. Um, but we'll let this go for another, we'll let this go for another minute or two. So what I'm seeing here is a lot of words. I definitely see caregiver as a front and center as one of the biggest words, but I also see a lot of other important words, um, granddaughter, primary, support person, daughter, wife, family, Tia. I mean, just so many different words here to represent what how you see yourself in relation to the person that you're caring for, okay? And that's, um, that's so important. So now I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, we'll, we'll keep this going in case people still want it. We can come back to it towards the end of the presentation. So, these are other words 
some of them are already on the word cloud that you all provided um, that people refer how people refer to themselves. So even if you hear me say the word caregiver, if you hear um, a doctor, a nurse, or a researcher say the word caregiver, um, your words are just as valid. We just use that word to kind of summarize um, a group of a group of relationships. Okay, so now let's look at some patterns about people who are caring for someone with cancer or cancer caregivers specifically. So these are going to be descriptions taken from survey data um, from that survey that I mentioned earlier that was taken in 2019 of a sample of, of adults across the United States um, who indicated that they were caring for someone with cancer. So some of these um, statistics may or may not resonate with you, but let's look at some of the overall patterns. Okay, so from the survey, we found that about 42% of cancer caregivers are men, and the average age of, of caregivers who are caring for someone with cancer is about 53 years old, but of course, people um, covered the whole, um, whole age range. Um, very racially and ethnically diverse, um, similar to some of the um, distribution that we see across the U.S. in the, in the census, um, with um, most caregivers being white and non-Hispanic, but a sizable amount being um, non-white, so 16% uh, Hispanic, 11% Black, and 8% identifying as Asian American, non-Hispanic, and then the remainder identifying as um, with another race and ethnicity. About 62% of cancer caregivers are married. Note that this doesn't necessarily mean that they're married to the person that they're taking care of, but 62% are married. Um, about 15% live in a rural area. 11% um, are currently active duty military or veterans themselves. 50% are, um, interestingly, are employed um, either full-time full or part-time as they're caregiving. And about 5% are identify as um, LGBTQ+. Um, furthermore, about 31% of individuals who are caring for someone with cancer are saying that they're doing this care alone, so that they're a sole caregiver. About 40% um, are indicating that their loved one receives some kind of paid help that could include a housekeeper or could include a home health aide. Um, the average time that people spend caring for someone with cancer tends to be shorter than um, compared to um, people who are caring for someone with an, another kind of serious illness or health problem, 1.9 years. In fact, the subtitle of this report was Cancer Caregiving um, an Intense Episodic Experience. Um, and the, however, um, that, this is where this intense piece comes in. <clears throat> the average time that um, cancer caregivers are, are supporting their, um, their care recipient is about 33 hours a week. Um, 44% of cancer caregivers are caring for either a parent or a parent-in-law, and that's a, a little um, higher than some of the other conditions that we might see, um, and that is in part, uh, we think, because cancer is more common in older adults than in younger adults. About 16% are caring for a spouse or a partner, um, and about 62% from this survey reported um, that they're experiencing a high burden and that's actually based on not their subjective experience of burden, but based on the number of hours per week and the level of assist assistance they're providing their loved one. So these patterns are just there to kind of give you a, a typical picture of a cancer caregiver, but again, there's a lot of diversity in the role and the experiences. Now let's talk about what caregivers actually do. And I wanna show you some, some, t some tasks that caregivers have been um, involved in or have reported helping with, and I wanna see if any of these um, resonate with you. So caregivers do many, many, many things to meet their uh, care recipients' day-to-day -day needs. And the first bucket um, in the gray is what we call, often referred to as activities of daily living. Um, so this can include things like getting dressed, um, helping with toileting and bathing, personal care and feeding. So this is pretty fundamental assistance to, just to get someone through their day. Um, the next set of tasks are what we call instrumental activities of daily living, so still very important for functioning, um, but not necessarily kind of in, as intense in terms of personal care. So this could be things like preparing meals, um, managing finances, um, going grocery shopping and doing a meal preparation, running errands, helping out with housework and transportation. 
Um, importantly, um, as particularly important, importantly for caregiving and cancer caregiving, um, clinical tasks that caregivers um, often uh, so help support um, for a cancer patient might be things like managing medication regimens, um, attending to wound care, um, symptom monitoring, which can be really important during active treatment, um, making decisions about uh, whether or not someone needs uh, to have additional uh, medical attention, so triage, um, and sometimes in, um, in caregiving port and catheter cleaning are really important for cancer patients and other forms of clinical tasks that, I, that aren't, of course, listed here. I'm sure you could come up with others. And then the final bucket that I have up here, but I guarantee you, you all, and, and, and Kara has a little note in the chat right now, you feel free to put additional things that I missed when I created this slide um, that you might be helping with. But um, social support in and of itself can really be thought about in different dimensions. So sometimes when people say social support, they think like, okay, they must be an emotional support or someone to talk to or you know, shoulder to cry on. But social support actually can mean many other things as well. So it could just be companionship, someone to sit, sit with, play a game with, just be with someone. Um, could also be looking up information. Um, oftentimes with cancer, there's a lot of research that patients and their families want to do to understand the diagnosis, understand possible treatments, understand side effects. So looking up information and providing that sort of informational support is a, is a huge source of support. Could be spiritual support, um, praying with someone, um, helping them attend religious services, for example. Um, coordination could really have like several different sub bullets, right? Because coordination could mean, <clears throat> could mean setting up medical appointments, um, could mean supportive care appointments, could mean just running someone's, you know, helping to manage someone's um, daily life. So, so all of the other things often require some coordination, whether it's coordinating housework, coordinating um, meal delivery, um, and everything that's sort of outside of, of course, the, the cancer experience. So maybe it's around child care or work responsibilities. And then finally and importantly, caregivers often play a huge role in patient advocacy, patient advocacy around insurance and um, getting in, um, uh, dealing with claims and benefits, um, perhaps advocating um, on behalf of their, their care recipient to the healthcare team as well. Um, so many, many, many things. Um, again, you're welcome to add more uh, to the chat. And I, I just happened to glance over. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have, have these slides be shared um, after the webinar is over and, and a recording will also be available. So I have this image up here um, that originally came from the National Institute for Caregiving because I think it's simple, um, but so on the nose, right? What, what we see in a hospital setting or, or healthcare practice, is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to caregiving, right? So there aren't, um, there's often no sort of off hours, right? You're sort of constantly being asked as a caregiver to be vigilant and watching for things that are unexpected. So that means that it really is, um, you know, a big iceberg phenomenon where so much of the bulk of the caregiving happens. Um, out, out of public view, out of the view of healthcare providers. I do want to touch on some unique aspects of cancer caregiving. So I find myself in the research and the policy work that I do often um, kind of playing devil's advocate where I'm talking about how there's so many commonalities of, of the caregiving experience that, that sort of transcend or go beyond um, a particular age or a particular illness context, right? That there are things that we can learn from folks who are caring for someone with dementia or someone with Parkinson's or someone with a, a child with complex care needs and same with cancer. <clears throat> and I think that's really important because, you know, the act of caring um, can be universal in a lot of respects. That said, there are definitely unique aspects of cancer caregiving that we don't want to lose and we want to continue to engage with our um, our healthcare uh, providers and clinicians about because it's really important because these unique aspects of cancer can have an impact on caregiving. So in cancer, um, one of the hallmarks is that someone's health status can change very quickly. 
Um, some cancer types are more slowly progressing, but others can change quickly, which might leave less time for a caregiver to plan or adapt. So that's an, that's an important um, aspect that affects caregiving. Um, treatments can be very complicated as well as the decision making around them. And there's new treatments that are often available, treatments like immunotherapy and targeted therapies, which is truly a sign of success um, um, from, you know, from bench to bedside, those, those treatments being developed. Um, but that can be very complicated and it can, it can set up uh, many more decision points than you might see for other, for other kinds of health problems and illnesses. Um, again, another hallmark of cancer is this idea of remission, that the cancer can kind of um, go silent for many years, which is so wonderful when we get to that, to that place, if we can. Um, but it also can mean that the cancer sometimes can come back. So this idea of recurrence and fear of recurrence can be pretty, can be very real and very common, and also something that not just patients experience, but their loved ones, their, can their caregivers as well. Um, Side effects, we, uh, we all know that um, cancer treatments um, have a level, uh, often have a level of toxicity associated with them. And so the side effects from treatments, sometimes they appear right away and sometimes they, they we have what are called late and long-term effects and we have to manage those. So that's another piece of the caregiving experience or the cancer experience that really can affect caregivers. Um, again, managing complicated, sometimes even hazardous med medication regimens, you know, where you have to touch them with gloves and whatnot. And then finally, um, this is a really big one for our, um, for our patients and their families, is cancer care is expensive. It can be so outrageously expensive that the financial impact of cancer is often called financial toxicity because of that. So um, I know I just kind of painted a grim picture, but I just say all of these things because the stress that many patients or families feel when they're going through this experience is um, very, very valid. And um, if anybody out there is feeling the stress of the cancer experience, um, you are not alone um, and there is support out there for you. So <laughs> um, how do caregivers do it all? I just mentioned a whole bunch of tasks that they help with. And then I also mentioned a whole bunch of things that were unique about the cancer experience of so how in the world do caregivers, do many of you do it all? Um, you know, with uh, invisible capes, I suppose. Because um, to be honest with you, um, many caregivers um, report that they do a lot of clinical care tasks, but don't feel prepared in doing it. So this is again from that same survey that I reported from earlier. Um, about half have reported um, that they weren't actually asked about what they needed to take care of their care recipient with. Um, so just basic sort of like, for example, clinical care training. And then sadly, 71% um, report um, not being asked what they need to take care of themselves. And we know that it's very difficult to take care of someone else if your needs aren't being met already. And this all probably <clears throat> is associated with the fact that about half are reporting high emotional stress. So it's not easy to do it all. Um, caregiving can be very hard. It usually is a juggle. Um, things are very rarely in balance and it's normal to feel burden and strain at times. So the short answer is here, no one can do it all. No one, um, no one can, at least no one can do it alone. Um, a lot of my research work, my intervention development work is about expanding that, that notion of a single caregiver to a network of care because really, um, the best situation is, is generally when caregivers themselves are feeling supported um, with other caregivers and other secondary carers support. So now let's shift to the, the brighter side of this presentation and talk about supports that may be out there for caregivers. Okay, so what's in the first aid toolkit for caregivers? Where can they get support? Well, for starters, um, there's many and growing sources of support. So this is the this is the good news part of the presentation. More and more cancer centers and practices that treat cancer patients are becoming aware of the needs of caregivers. And many of the comprehensive cancer centers, I happen to work at um, a UNC, which has a comprehensive cancer center, but they're all throughout the country. Um, you'll find something called a patient and family resource center. It can have um, different kinds of names, but some sort of a resource center that's designed to be able to provide information and support to patients and their families. Um, here at UNC, we have a physical space for this. In that space is a library of books um, for patients and caregivers about cancer, 
about different treatments, about self-management strategies and more. And the center is staffed with volunteers who are ready to help find information. We have some massage chairs in there that are not just for patients, they're also for caregivers, for sofas and recliners, and for people to just sort of sit and take a break away from the, um, from the clinic um, or inpatient space. We, like many cancer centers, have a caregiver-specific support group that meets weekly. Um, and we also try when we can to provide caregivers um, a free meal once a week. Um, within the care team, uh, the, the, the folks that are actually tending to the patient, especially if they're in active treatment, there may be a navigator um, who is there to help identify unmet needs from both the patient and the caregiver because um, navig navigators really understand that relationship that these are, that, that the, the problems of one go hand in hand with the problems of the other. And they are there to help connect to resources, to help um, make those kinds of referrals. Um, we also have social work, social, oncology social workers in our cancer center um, and nurses on the team who can often um, try to refer people. And then of course there's support in the community. So community organizations like this one, like Cancer Support Community and Gilda's Club are here to give that extra support to try to fill in some of the gaps that healthcare delivery um, can't meet um, with community support. So it's a wonderful resource for caregivers and patients alike. Um, there also, I want to point out, in addition to cancer targeted support, there are other um, additional sources of support um, through things like that area agencies on aging, um, which tend to have offices at the county level that can provide things like um, additional caregiver support groups and more and more of these are now available um, online, just like we're doing tonight. Um, there's also a something called the National Family Caregiver Support Program. And I'll talk a little about that toward the end of the presentation in terms of some of the policy movement, but that can provide sometimes additional resources and, and connections um, and, and sometimes often respite options. So you, you might be able to find things like um, uh, information about certified home health agencies or adult daycare centers, if that's a respite option that might work for you in your situation. Um, I will say too that, you know, as you're trying to, if you're looking out there for support um, for yourself as a caregiver or for caregiving, certain some of the actions that you're trying to take, maybe you, um, you're looking for additional um, information, do look, use the term in your search as caregiver, or caregivers or caregiving, because it is a term that most support centers um, use. There's many forms of support. So I mentioned how social support comes in lots of forms. Well, there's many forms of informational support. Um, so uh, sometimes caregivers can feel overwhelmed with the amount of information out there for information about cancer. I try to advise people to start with the National Cancer Institute and or the American Cancer Society, which is very vetted information about cancer. Um, but there's also great information out there about caregiving. So um, these are some, again, vetted sources of information that are um, specifically targeted towards caregiving. So the American Association of Retired Persons has a lot of information about caregiving tasks. So they have videos on, um, on caregiving tasks that can be very helpful. So things like bed and, and um, chair transfers, bathing um, a loved one, um, trying to make a, um, a home uh, fall safe, things like that. Um, <clears throat> they also are one of the leading organizations on driving policy to support caregivers. So you can find information about policies um, in your own particular state that might be supportive uh, of caregivers. So um, good resource for you. There's two big organizations, two big advocacy organizations that are solely dedicated to caregiving since so this is caregivers across um, different health problems and and context, the National Alliance for Caregiving, whose data I've been uh, mentioning during this talk, as well as the Family Caregiver Alliance, which is based out of the West Coast. Both of them have great um, resources um, on caregiving um, information. I also wanna point out psychological and emotional support um, forms. Um, you know, we already talked a little bit about support groups, um, but these are great and so many more available now um, virtually. Um, individual counseling can be a great option for, for just about anybody at, at certain points in time. And even cancer centers themselves are now recognizing the need for individual counseling 
for caregivers specifically. So Dr. Allison Applebaum, who's going to be a speaker in the series later, actually offers a clinic at Memorial Sloan Kettering where she works specifically for caregivers of people with cancer. So this is an example. Um, there are um, additional um, helplines. So Cancer Support Community, that CSC, has a helpline. I have that up there too. Um, and I'm sure Kara can add that to the chat when I navigate past this slide. Um, another organization called Cancer Care has a, has a hotline that I put up there as well. I also just wanted to mention a program called Immerman's Angels, um, which sets up peer mentoring for um, individuals with cancer. Um, they call it like a survivor and a fighter, but they also have caregiver mentors where they can set up, if you're looking for someone who you just want a sort of a personal connection with that can help guide you through the whole journey of being a cancer caregiver, um, Immerman's Angels can actually kind of can, can, can often um, provide that kind of personal one-on-one -on -one support. Other forms of support, coordination um, is a big one, right? Um, and this is certainly one that, um, that should, should not have to be tackled with alone. So <laughs> let me just start by saying like, if, if, if a notebook and pen works for you, if you like to have your sort of your, your paper planner out for taking notes, for kind of you know recording things like appointments for your care recipient, that's great. Do what works for you. I also want to point out there are online um, support resources out there. Um, Caring Bridge is 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 one of the better known ones. It's supposed to be a a site that kind of allows you to do things like journal and blog about. Um, a care experience, but then invite people in a social network so you're not having to give updates, um, you know, sort of over and over and over again, the same update. And they also have um, resources on that site to link you to uh, things like GoFundMe, if there's a fundraising effort that you wanna, you wanna lead, um, as well as MealTrain, which is um, a great uh, resource for organizing um, meal delivery so that, again, you're not having to have the same conversation with a dozen people um, trying to schedule something meal train and Caring Ridge tries to take that and automate some of those processes so um, you, you can kind of streamline the communication and coordination. Let me just add here that this is a great thing if, if you are a caregiver and you're feeling overwhelmed by like yet another thing that you feel like you have to plan. If you are, if someone is in your life is coming up to you saying, what can I do? What can I do to help you? What can I do? And maybe you've gone through a period of time where you're like, I just don't even know what to tell this person. They're here to help, but I don't know what to tell them. Um, if there's someone that you, you feel comfortable with asking, some of the coordination work can be a great way to help. So getting them to set up a meal train or getting them to help communicate for, for, uh, via caring bridge can be a great, great way. Um, and it looks like we've got other um, folks in the chat saying uh, giving additional resources to try out because, of course, there's so many different um, there's so many different types of these sites. That whereas you know 10, 15 years ago there were there was sort of only a few. Now there's far more. I, I also have Care Gather as another one up there, as well. Um, there's more. Uh, there's newer models of providing something called respite care. So what do I mean by respite care? I mean I mean, the caregiver getting to take a break. <laughs> um, so if you're in a situation where you're, um, where you're providing several hours a week of, of, of care and support to your um, care recipient, everybody needs a break, right? And so sometimes that break can come in the form of a friend or a family member stepping in, um, but sometimes you need professional help. And depending on the level of, it, of intensity that you might need, um, there are, you know, elder care and home health aides. Um, we have something called Care Yaya now, which is just starting in um, North Carolina to try to actually match college students who are looking to provide um, some personal home health companionship, uh, but not necessarily nursing care to, um, to older adults who, who need a little bit of respite. So there's, there's different forms of respite care um, out there for people. Advocacy. Um, advocacy doesn't always, you know, you don't always necessarily think of advocacy with support, but it is a form of support and it can be. There can be benefits for caregivers that they don't necessarily know about. So FMLA or Family Medical Leave Act covers many, many, many types of employment situations. Um, not all, unfortunately. So I th the, the basic stipulations for what we call FMLA are um, that you have to work for a company that has at least 50 employees, and I believe you have to have worked there for over 
six months to be um, eligible for it, but then it's supposed to provide up to 12 weeks of unpaid but protected leave from an employment situation. So um, good to know about that sort of basic protection. More and more states are coming on board with some paid family medical leave. The devil's, of course, in the details, um, but there's now 11 states that provide some degree of paid family, med paid family medical leave. Um, you want to know, um, though, if you're eligible based on relationship type and, again, based on some of those employment um, considerations. But these are things that are good to know about. Um, and then, of course, Medicaid funds um, home and community-based services for people who are eligible. So these are just some of the forms of um, aid that can be out there. Um, the, probably a good person to talk to for looking for this type of support is um, a social worker either at the cancer center or more in the community. Um, and I know that cancer support community has um, a more uh, detailed referral sources that they can give you. Okay, so I'm now gonna kind of pan out and do a little bit of a what's next in caregiving um, policy and supports um, on the big picture. Um, again, to give, give some hope. So I wanna draw your attention to several national support reports and some legislation that have come out recently to increase support for caregivers, for people with cancer, but also more broadly. So there was a report in 2018 called Families Caring for Aging America that was put out by the um, Institute, sorry, the National Academies, Academy of Medicine. And that led to, and there was another report also about the Oncology Care Force, also by the National um, Academies of Medicine. Um, and that precipitated a, um, a piece of legislation called RAISE, which stands for Recognize, Assist, um, Include, Support, and Engage Family Caregivers Act, which is designed, which was signed into law in 2018, it was designed to create a national strategy to support family caregivers. And that in last, or this actually a couple months ago, um, the, Nas the, the national strategy put out a report of 350 different pieces of federal activities that were either proposed or ongoing in support of the act. Um, and if you really want to drill down into it, you can you can look into the act and find out um, what is being proposed uh, to, to sort of count towards supporting family caregivers. And you can actually make public comments right now until the end of the month, so in honor of um, November being um, Family Caregiver Month. But these are the big buckets that RAISE um, suggests is that we need to increase awareness of family caregivers. So just actually to increase the, so the notion of um, recognizing the, the role and, and how valuable family caregivers are, engage family caregivers as partners, improve access to services and supports, um, create some better financial and workplace security for family caregivers, and then generate research data and evidence-informed practices, again, to undergird all of the other recommendations. All right, as I come to a close, I wanted to point out, you know, I um, I could never put into words more eloquently than um, family caregivers themselves telling their stories. And the National Alliance for Caregiving in honor of the RAISE Act put together this great caregiver spotlight. This is just eight of the different um, caregivers who participated in this up on the screen, but they're sort of like cards that you can go in, you can read their stories, you can see if maybe any of them resonate with you. And then they have very short videos, and I'm going to play one of them before um, before we head to Q&A so that you can kind of see what I mean um, about what kind of a resource this is. So um, I will go ahead and do that now. Um, I didn't fully understand or embrace what it meant to be a caregiver um, until way, way, way late. The doctor said to, to me that my life was going to change pretty significantly, which I thought was kind of a strange thing, thing to say um, when my husband was the one who just been diagnosed. Um, and I didn't realize that at the time, but I basically became a caregiver from that moment. This process, I mean, it really took a huge toll on me. I mean, I, I wasn't sleeping. 
Um, I wasn't going to the doctor for myself, surely not. Um, I wasn't taking time for any breaks to restore myself. Um, I wasn't taking care of my relationship with my husband. Um, I was moved out of my role at work. Um, I can't tell you the number of cavities that I've gotten through this process because it's like even something as basic as making sure to brush my own teeth came last after everything, everybody else. Honestly, the people that helped me the most helped me figure out what, what the landscape of possibilities were, were other um, brain tumor uh, wives who spoke to me about their struggles. That's what would actually be the most useful. Um, just that 15 minute conversation with someone who's lived that experience might bring up things that you didn't even know were possible. I thought they were teaching me all of this as sort of like a backup, you know, like in case something, someone is delayed in traffic, here's it. And I didn't realize until I got home and the hospice people started coming that I was actually the person who was gonna have to do all of this. And and then I was like, I, I can't work. I, someone has to do all of this. And so I, I had to stop working. I did everything for the most part the way that I wanted to it cost me and my husband and my children and our family so much. And yet it was a privilege. Um, I'm glad that I had the means to be able to do it the way that I did. And, and still there's so much that we lost because of how, how little real support as a, at a societal level that I had. You're gonna get sick. Your family members are gonna get sick. Your kids might get sick. That is a given. So given that that's going to happen, why do we not have a solution for how to help people? Wow, um, I hope, I've seen that now several times and it just continues to grab. Um, I, you know, I encourage you to, to look in the, on this spotlight, um, series and look at look at some of the other stories um, of the caregivers and see if that kind of helps um, put some perspective out there and to help you realize that you know 53 million caregivers were um, were connected in so many more ways than we realize so that's the end of my talk um, I, I really appreciate you being here on a on, in, during your evening um, time and, um, and giving me your, your time and attention and I know that there's been some comments in the chat, so I guess I'll sort of ask Kara to help me with any questions or comments that people want to people want to make. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Erin. If I don't believe there are any lingering questions in the chat, but if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll make sure they get read and Erin can answer them. There were a number of great resources that were shared and um, please take a look at those. And thank you everyone for also kind of sharing your experiences and what's resonated with you as a caregiver or however you kind of might identify. Um, I don't see any questions coming okay. in at the moment. So I, as um, we, oh, go ahead. Oh, wait, I was gonna say, I can click through two. We've got, I know we've got probably a couple of messages that will come in, but I can also click through so that, um, yeah. We can talk about the rest of the series too. Yeah, absolutely. There aren't aren't questions, but I did want to share this one that came through just a comment that says, thanks so much for all the resources. This, this is the beginning of a difficult journey for me and I appreciate your time. And I think we can all kind of resonate with what you said there, Karen. So thanks for sharing. Um, just a quick kind of housekeeping things as we see if any more questions do come in. We will be sharing the PowerPoint, so you should receive that in an email after the webinar is over. And it, yes, it will come in a PDF form. 
You will also be um, receiving a link to a survey and that will actually show up right as the webinar ends and uh, through an email from Zoom. So if you can take a couple moments and fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. It's really the best way for us to get an idea of kind of what you'd like to see next. And absolutely, um, we would love and encourage you to attend the next couple sessions that we have in the caregiver series. So as Erin had mentioned, Allison Applebaum will be our next speaker around kind of self-care tips. So please make sure to tune in there as well. And I know there are a couple questions in that Q&A, so let me pop those up. Yep, and yep, we will be sharing those slides of those resources. And then the next question is, how do you envision the 15 minute peer support that Abina mentioned, Erin, if you wanna touch on that one. Hi, Maureen, thank you for that question. Um, I think, you know, um, there's lots of different ways that support can happen. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, it can, it can be as, as short as 15 minutes. I think she was discussing how, having somebody as a peer, so somebody that had been through what she was going through was incredibly helpful for her. I think it felt very authentic and just probably far more tailored and customized to her experience. I think um, finding others that have, that are either currently walking or have walked um, the path that you are on right now um, can be really helpful. Um, now that, you know, so much of, of how we access um, and communicate um, these days is is through our phones. And so, you know, sometimes a text, sometimes setting up a, a, a quick phone call with someone who's already been there or is going through it can be incredibly, incredibly restorative and validating. So um, I'll mention again, um, support groups are, can be a source of that as well as, um, as well as something like a mentorship program and Immerman's Angels and other, other programs out there like that can, um, can really help facilitate making those connections. All right, well, unless there are any other questions that come in, I think that wraps us up for our time. So again, thank you everyone for joining and also just for the invaluable and instrumental care that you provide for your loved ones with cancer. And thank you, Erin, for your talk as well. I know I learned a lot and that video is just as powerful as ever whenever you see it. So again, thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of your night. Take care, everyone. Thank you.